Hello there, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Along the way, if you are new here and you enjoy what you are hearing, please consider hitting that subscribe button. And don't forget to set your notification bell to all, that way you'll be reminded of every time I upload a video. And for the curious ones, if you'd like to learn how to become a member, that information can be found down below. Without further ado, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Scary Ghost Stories. Yes, this one has been requested for a long time, so we're going to go ahead and tell it. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. I had little experiences before meeting my husband, but since being with him, I've had too many to count. For my first time sharing, I figured I'd tell the most intense ones so far. It's kind of long, so bear with me. We had moved into a new house, and the first night there is what started everything. My husband is a walking magnet for the paranormal and had a crazy dream about the house. In the dream, he said we were in bed watching TV, and when he looked down the hallway, he saw a lady standing at the end of it. At the same moment, she started screaming and running at us at full speed. A face print burned into the wall, and as soon as she reached him, he woke up physically screaming. After that night, things started getting weird. We'd hear people whispering, see shadows out of the corner of our eyes, We'd even get the ickiest feeling just walking anywhere in the house. It got to the point where we all camped in the living room, and before it got dark, I'd grab everything I'd need for the night, and everyone refused to leave that room until morning because, for whatever reason, nothing would happen in that room. We'd sit and watch shadows peek around the corners throughout the night and hear whispers until we fell asleep. A few weeks into living there, my husband was taking the dog out and left the door open, and when he turned around to come back in, he saw what he can only describe as the top hat man standing in the doorway and turning to walk through the house. It scared him so bad that he ran inside the house and smoked the whole house out with the entire bundle of sage that I had. Things only escalated from there and I'd get this feeling of doom that sat so heavy on my chest that I had to go sit outside to get it to go away. We eventually found out that an older man had passed away in the apartment below ours at some point. A few months into living there, the new tenant downstairs ended up having an electrical fire, which ultimately made everyone have to vacate. It's been a couple of years since we've lived there, and we still talk about it from time to time. Trigger warning for those sensitive to domestic violence. Hi, y'all. I posted a video of a rocking chair moving back and forth by itself in my wife and son's hospital room. I'd felt encouraged to open up about one of the experiences my family has had over the years. This one occurred fairly recently in an old townhome we had been renting. The area we lived in was in an economic decline and getting rough. We had a few rowdy neighbors, and the ones subjected in this story were a young couple living with one of their grandmothers. The couple had two darling little girls who loved our daughter and took to playing with her. By appearances, during the daytime, the couple were fine and swell. However, they would have parties almost every Friday and Saturday. Once liquor was involved, it was only a couple of 
hours before they took their arguments from inside the grandmother's home to outside, sloshing their tea to the whole neighborhood. Eventually, the husband would get physical and pin his wife against the car or a wall. They would scream, yell, hit each other, etc. The cops would be called and, frequently, the husband would be carted off to jail while both spouses mouthed off to the police officers. Despite the drama in the house, their little girls always seemed to be in good spirits and outgoing. After some time, the couple began selling and giving away some of their things in preparation to move out. The little girls gave my wife a box of dolls, some new, some vintage. We gladly accepted them and put them in the kids' room. The dolls would be waiting for our daughter when she came back from her grandmother's house the next day. After a couple of hours, my wife, baby son, our cat Sebastian, and myself were downstairs hanging out when we heard a huge thud and a crashing sound from the kids' room. After checking, nothing appeared out of sort. Everything was exactly as it had been. We checked our closets, our room, and nothing had fallen. Perplexed, we went back downstairs. As the afternoon rolled into evening, we heard the thud and crashing again. And, as before, nothing had been touched. At this point, we considered a wild animal had gotten in. So, we continued searching and again turned up empty-handed. After dinner, my wife took our son upstairs to feed him in our bedroom. The rest of this is solely her experience. As she was lying there with the baby, she heard the crash sound again from the bedroom. She saw Sebastian sitting in the hallway, staring into the darkness of the kid's room, ears perked up and frozen. About that time, she began to hear a little girl's voice coming from the room, and then the sound of a child sobbing. Knowing full well that no one was in the room, she comes downstairs to me, being asleep on the sofa, and tells me what was going on. She suspected the dolls. She marched upstairs, grabbed the box, and tossed them into the dumpster outside. We never had another disturbance ever again. This story happened three years ago when I was 15 in my village. I don't tell this story much because people tend to think I'm making it up. But I've been thinking of it quite a lot this week and I want people to know. My village is located in a rural area that is protected by the government because it has been considered a national paradise for the last 30 years. This means that exploration in the area is quite difficult nowadays, since it is forbidden to cut trees, which means that it is a huge forest. I was spending my summer there, and my favorite thing was going hiking, although I had never gone alone into the woods, just roads with many people. My grandma had told me that cleaning services had opened and rehabilitated a path that had been covered in bushes and trees for the last 30 years because of a race that was being prepared, like runners and stuff. Usually I'd go to the nearest town, which was one hour away by foot, by the only way I knew, the road. On my way back from seeing friends there, I took the new path my granny said was safe alone. That was a mistake. The first part of the path was the easiest. Just too many obstacles and landslides, but it was nothing compared to the rest. The second part of a hill full of rocks, that was the hardest thing to go up. Literally had to climb on four legs like a dog. When I got to the top, I looked around and found some animal bones. I didn't pay too much of attention to it, since the area is known for its big population of wolves and bears that go out at night. I continued my way faster than before. This part was plain floor, 
where the woods really began. So, it was a relief until I got to the dead end. Some huge trees had fallen exactly on a row on the path, and it was impossible to cross it. This seems really off to me because there were no other fallen trees. The weirdest part? Aside from those trees, there was a little barn. Yes, a barn. In the middle of the woods. I thought to myself that it was probably abandoned. At least it looked like it was. So I decided to throw my bag into the little field that belonged to the barn and then I crossed the fence. I crossed it, running without realizing the most bizarre thing. That field had no trees in it. It was clear. No bushes, no big plants, nada. It really shouldn't be like that, even if it was abandoned. I started feeling concerned about how the location of the fallen trees were so coincidental, how there casually was a barn beside it with a clear field when the path had been closed for 30 years. It just seemed really off. I went on and luckily I was reaching the last hill my grandmother had described, the one that connected with my village. Suddenly, there was a silent moment in the woods, which allowed me to hear some branches cracking all around me. I thought to myself it was a bird or something, but they came closer. They really sounded like footsteps. After trying to convince myself it was probably an animal, I was so afraid I couldn't even look back. I started walking faster. Guess what? So did the footsteps. I just started running, never noticing that, and so did the footsteps again. I was running for my life at this point. Suddenly, I started hearing incredibly loud grunts. Everything was just going really fast. Luckily, I got to my village in a minute or so after that. I got into the patio of the first house I found and closed the door. It was a relative's house, no need to call the police. I stayed there for ten minutes until I got my breath back and then came back home. I get chills just remembering the place, not having signal in the middle of nowhere and the grunts. It makes me think there was something following me since the barn and the trees were just a distraction to slow me down. I never ever went into the woods alone after that. Back around 2001, I was in Dublin, Ireland for a trip. I was there with my ex fiance and it was during some outbreak of hoof or mouth or mad cow disease. I forgot. Well, anyway, tourism suffered, which was bad for places like Ireland, but ended up being really great for us. A lot of the places we went to got excellent service and people were generally glad to have us. One of the side effects was certain tourist places were kind of empty. One morning, shortly after breakfast, we decided to go to Christ Church Cathedral. I also had a follow-up on this place, but let me first tell you what happened. We do the tour of the church and just generally walk around. I had a camcorder, as back then, cell phone cameras weren't really a great option. I also used to love my 35mm SLR camera. That camera alone, I think back then, I paid like $600 or more for it. So, I wanted to use it to take a bunch of nice photos. Anyway, we are touring the church. I am mostly using the camcorder inside the church. But, I do take some overall shots inside. Down the pews, and there's a lot of footbridge from Christ Church to Dublin, so I take some photos in there. Something in that foot walk made me feel really uncomfortable. My ex is also feeling sick after a while, and she said to me, let's leave this place. We go on with the rest of our tour in Dublin. 
then go home. We get home, and a few days after we arrive, some friends come over, and I start to play my camcorder recordings of shots of Dublin, Dublin Castle, Trinity College, Guinness, Christ Church, Temple Bar, and some shots of our side trip to Wicklow. When the part of Inside Christ Church comes up, one of our friends asks, who's that? Crying. I didn't hear it, and my ex jumps up and is like, holy shit. We rewind the tape and put the volume up as loud as it will go. We can hear someone crying, like moaning type crying. The thing is, it's following us around most of the video. The next day, we take my 35mm film to get developed, and on four photos, you can see a smoke swirl, like one swirling and coming off a wall, another hanging overhead. Then the photos of the footpath between Christ Church and Dublin, there is flames on the corner of the wall. Now, years have passed, probably about 11 years, and I am married and happen to take a trip to Europe. And we have a few days back in Dublin. I tell my wife about my prior experience in Christ Church. We go inside and do the tour. The funny thing is, I didn't get deja vu, but everything seems really different. Like, I remember a little walking path behind the church, nearest the Liffey, that was not there. The inside layout is all different like the pews. Well, it was a decade later that I came back, so I shook it off. We take some cell phone photos and videos. We get back to the hotel, and I didn't see anything. But then my wife is like, who is that guy behind me? I said, maybe another visitor. She said no one was around us when we took those pictures. The guy has his head turned, not looking at us, but is really close to my wife. She said if someone had been that close, she would have noticed. So, I don't know what else to think about that place. Maybe someday I will go back and check it out once more. My boyfriend of five years has crushed on me for probably 12 or 13 years. He was two grades below me and was a bad boy while I was popular and in an all honors and college level classes. So I wasn't aware he existed until I met him and my dad's business about seven years ago. He apparently talked about me being his dream girl and was teased that it would only ever happen. And that is why I mention this. So, in 2009, he and his best friend, I'll just call him Josh, was getting into pills due to Josh's grandfather being an amputee and unable to properly attend, or understand, hiding the medications, thus leaving large amounts of methadone, colonopin, hydrocodone, and such lying around. This was before the opiate crisis that has affected my generation deeply in the last 15 years. Two days before Christmas of 2009, Josh overdosed in the bathroom that my boyfriend is currently staying in. It's a long story, but we have moved back to our respective families because we were laid off during the pandemic and were in a bad wreck, losing the extra car. The room has never felt spooky, never anything strange about it. But I've had a few pranks pulled on me that we believe Josh does to basically congratulate my boyfriend on being with the woman he waited for. I've woken up to sticky notes completely covering my body, my drinks poured on the floor, and random objects moving right where I exit the bed so that I step on them first thing in the morning. I swear I've heard giggling. Each time I've angrily asked my boyfriend if he was messing with me and I'm aware when he is lying. He always says no. We like to think this is Josh playing practical jokes, something he was known for, but this is nothing compared to what Josh did for me in 2017. 
It wasn't a prank. It saved my life. Four years ago, I went into an anaphylactic shock. I lost all ability to speak or move my lower body. I was upstairs with a curved and steep staircase separating me from my phone. I remember crawling to the stairs, knowing it could be fatal if I smashed into the wall that the stairs led to before the turn with very large, steep steps. I know I was extremely oxygen-deprived, but I immediately saw Josh and the two of my deceased best friends ascend the stairs and carry me to the living room couch with my nebulizer and cell phone. I called 911, but I had no voice. My friends were gone except Josh. He told me he was going to wake my boyfriend from the hammock in the back of my yard. And suddenly, my boyfriend dreamed of his friend saying that I was in trouble. My boyfriend came running into the house, and by this point, I was dying. I no longer could use any part of my body, and no air came into my lungs when I inhaled. I remember thinking of my daughter and praying her father would navigate my loss to her and keep memories of me alive. He actually died in a freak accident eight months ago, so now I'm fulfilling that for him, but I digress. I struggled to remain conscious, but I was fainting. My boyfriend saw the 911 operator on the phone and my sweaty blue body. He told them he didn't think I was breathing, and by some absolute miracle, there was an ambulance passing my neighborhood. The hospital and dispatch were 30 minutes away. The coincidence, plus my boyfriend's sudden premonition, that I was hurt saved my life. Josh and those EMT saved my life. I remember the EMT asking my boyfriend if I had overdosed. Of course I hadn't because I don't dabble in drugs. And I thought of how Josh had died. I was blabbering on about dead people saving me after a large amount of epinephrine, so no wonder they thought I was high. The doctors and EMT were baffled at how I managed to get down those stairs or even stay alive long enough to get help. I had one bruise on my leg that was tiny. That was it. And the worst headache I've ever had. Turns out, I'm allergic to the latex and spray paint. I just told them I slid down the stairs, but it's not how I remember it. The weird thing is, I'd never met Josh when he was alive. I don't know how I recognized him or hallucinated him, but he looked exactly like the picture I had been shown. I've had a lot of paranormal encounters, but my run in with Josh saved my life, and he never even knew me. So, thanks, Josh, for giving me more time on this earth, and I wish we had met many years before. I do hope he is resting peacefully, just periodically popping in to check on us. It's always interesting to me how strange and unusual my home state of Washington really is. Thinking about it, it's had dozens of serial killers pass through, come from or live there. We have high rates of Sasquatch sightings, countless UFO reports over the Cascade Mountains, and more eerie little towns like a Stephen King novel. Between June of 2010 and July of 2011, I attended the Cascades Job Corps program in Cedro Woolley, Washington, a rather quaint, albeit weird, mountain town, which bled into neighboring Burlington and Mount Vernon. I highly recommend that if you're in the part of the Northwest Washington, you should pay it a visit. The area is absolutely beautiful. Plus, if you're feeling the need to give yourself the creeps, Put on the theme to Twin Peaks on your phone as you drive around. Trust me, you'll love it. Cascades Job Corp was a beautiful campus, somewhat isolated from the main body of Cedra Woolley, 
with only one road in and one road out. The overall area has a sense of being on an island surrounded by dense woodlands. As you enter, you see to your left, after a short, narrow drive, an abandoned three-story building covered in creepy vines and other parasitic plants common to the area. To the right, you see the lush green yards dotted with massive trees of varied species, and behind them, you see the first of the four dorms. By this time, I feel like I must make it known that the property, as far as I was able to determine, had only been a campus for the Job Corps program for less than 20 years at that point. According to the information I gleaned from back when I was a student, the campus was built as an asylum for the mentally disturbed. The oldest buildings still standing when I was an attendee were originally where the patients were kept, which was made somewhat obvious when you consider the common areas were built with thick observation windows to look in, and all the windows on site were heavily reinforced. Given that this campus had once been a lunatic asylum, naturally many stories and legends cropped up, often being told to the new input groups of fresh students by people who had been there a while. Of these stories, the two most common that were told related to a little girl wearing a red dress set to haunt the halls of two of the dorms, and the other one of an angry Native American spirit that stalks the property at night. Additionally, you have stories of students hosting seances, using Ouija boards, and summoning nefarious spirits and all the other common spooky events one would expect from an old asylum. What can I say with certainty is that there was something about that campus that was supernatural. Myself being a cultist, I've learned over the years that certain places house a variety of very palpable energy, an energy that has a habit of attracting spirits, elemental entities, and negative forces. Why this is, especially for that campus, I can only speculate. My own theory is that because the campus houses several hundred students, ranging in ages from 16 to 24, many of which come from rather turbulent backgrounds too long to list here, whose own energies and psychological traumas imprint on the land. This is only amplified when you also consider that many years prior to the school, the area had been home to untold amounts of people suffering from insanity and likely had been subjugated to a cornucopia of terrible procedures indicative to the time. Regardless, my year spent on campus had seen my encounters some unusual instances of the paranormal the first of which happened one month after entering the program. I was sitting with my then-girlfriend and our mutual friend on a bench, which was located outside an old church, which sat behind my dorm and was connected to the cafeteria and one of the storage areas. As we were talking, we heard something from near the church, which was then surrounded by unkempt hedges and bushes, a very loud low growl. Now, for the record, all of us were worried a wild animal had wandered onto campus. It had happened before, and signs all over warned students about the possibility of bears, cougars, wild dogs, coyotes, and even porcupines. And it stood to reason that in that moment, we were about to come face to face with a predatory animal. As we jumped up, we slowly began to back away. My girlfriend and a friend behind me pulling at me, though I kept trying to tell them not to run, but move slowly in case it was in fact an animal. I was just about to tell both of them to remain calm when I suddenly felt a hard, forceful push on my chest, which staggered me back a few feet and almost knocked all three of us to the ground. Naturally, I was stunned. Nothing was in front of us, 
just open air, and yet I had felt as if two large hands had pressed against my chest and pushed me back with full force. And as I stood my ground, trying to figure out what the hell had happened, I had been pulled away and forced into a run with my friends. Later that night, I would find on my chest where I was pushed two large red marks that looked and felt like sunburns. The second incident that happened to me was several months and two girlfriends later, around Christmas time, I do believe. Normally, the campus is very vacated since most of the students go home for the holiday break. Sadly, my only family was too far to justify the trip, and so I opted to stay. Needless to say, I was the only person in my dorm for that break, which was great. I basically had full reign over the common area, could watch anything on TV, get first pick on the good snacks. It was great. Plus, the additional privacy was always the bonus. Halfway through the break, I decided after lunch to take a hot shower and made my way into the stalls. I kicked on the water, let it run so it would get hot, and hopped in. As I was standing under the hot water, I felt a cold breeze on my feet, which was unusual. There were no windows in the showers, and the whole dorm was heated consistently throughout. However, in that instance, I didn't think much of it. The very clear and loud sound of a child's giggle, on the other hand, I did think much of. So here I was, standing naked and covered in soap, alone in a dormitory, and... I hear what sounds like a small child giggling right behind the shower curtain behind me, which prompted me to spin on my heel, throw open the curtain to find nothing there, save for a very cold blast of air. And naturally, when you have something so random and creepy happen, the best thing I felt to do was rinse off, put on my robe, and book it down to my bay. That's what we call our rooms and lock the door. Now, had this happened when there were other people on site, I would have thought it was a prank, which was very, very common. Here's the problem. In my dorm, I was alone, save for the RA who was downstairs, who also was a no-nonsense kind of dude. I thought maybe it came from downstairs, since the vents did connect. But again, Nobody was there. I even later went back with a stepladder to look into the vent to see if someone put some kind of speaker or something in there to mess with whoever stayed behind for break. Nothing. Not a damn thing. I apologize for the length, but this requires a bit of a backstory. Over 10 years ago, my boyfriend and I were driving around the country over an hour from our house. We were just driving for the hell of it, but were also half-heartedly looking for this little waterfall we had heard about in the area. So we left the main highway and took the side road which wound up and down a big hill and eventually found ourselves down in a little hollow, which slowly opened up to a big valley. Everything seemed normal until we passed those stone gate posts, which then led us in this crazy little split road, which had an avenue of carefully planted trees running down the median. We were seriously out, practically in the middle of nowhere. And there was no reason we could fathom for this fancy road to exist out there. We passed a few big abandoned buildings and grand steps, which led to empty concrete foundations, but other than that, there were just a few scattered, regular lived-in houses. After finding the waterfall's location, we turned around and headed back home the way we came in. And we finally saw a historical marker. Turns out, this was one of only a handful of ghost towns in our state, and the name immediately rang a bell, 
as a co-worker who was into the supernatural had just told me about this place and that it is very, very haunted. It had been the site of a big printing press back in the early 1900s, and an entire, nearly self-sufficient town had grown up around it. It was apparently quite fancy in its heyday, with a big hotel, a trade school, and several health spas, as doctors used to send people to the area to recover from tuberculosis. When the press closed down, the town quickly went downhill, and the buildings mostly either fell or burned down, except for the few we had seen. I think the official year of its demise was somewhere around 1976, when the post office closed. We drove home that day without incident, but a few weeks later, my boyfriend's younger sister was staying the night at our place, and we began telling ghost stories. The two of us kind of looked at each other like, you thinking what I'm thinking? And asked her if she wanted to go see a ghost town. Like right now. She was game and we hopped into the car a bit after 1 a.m. and drove to this place. We were all excited and found ourselves going down that hill into the valley in no time. It was around 2 a.m. at this point, and we thought we'd just do a quick circuit down the avenue of trees and turn around. Half the fun was just being out at this hour and having the freedom to go wherever we wanted, whenever as we were only 18 at the time and had just gotten our own place. We reached the road of the avenue and turned around. No sign of any ghosts, but my boyfriend said something I will never forget. Maybe we'll see a Bigfoot instead. The three of us got a heavy laugh out of that, as we believed in ghosts, but Bigfoot seemed silly. Yes, I know, the logic of that escapes me too. We passed the stone gate posts and a little ways up the left, we began to see a few lived-in houses signaling the end of the ghost town. And y'all, here's where the shit hits the fan. As our car crept up the road, our headlights hit this thing. It was standing in a ditch on the left side of the road on two legs and was using its Four paws, four hands, I guess. Like it was looking for something on the embankment it was facing. It was kind of hunched over, but if it stood up straight, it would have been around five feet tall. It was covered in brownish, black matted hair, or fur, whatever you want to call it. So the body just looked like a big, shapeless mass of hair, with arms and legs that seemed relatively skinny compared to its body. And when it turned its head to stare at us, we realized it didn't have a muzzle, but instead a flat face like an ape. Even with our bright lights on, we couldn't see a mouth or nose, just the eyes. And they were freaking cliche glowing red, like two pinpricks in this awful featureless face. This wasn't simple eye shine from our headlight. It was like they were glowing on their own accord. We all see the damned thing and simultaneously yell, Is that a bear? Is that a dog? And is that a cat? This is how confused we were, and the whole time this thing was just stood there, staring. It wasn't scared, and it didn't move a muscle other than to straighten up and turn its head to look at us when our light first hit it. All these thoughts were racing through our heads, and we all sensed that something was very off about this encounter. Honestly, we were all three afraid of this creature. It didn't give off a warm and fuzzy feeling, I'll tell you that, and wanted to get the hell out of that valley ASAP. We had slowed the car to a crawl to get a good look at it, but when our brains tried to process it and came up with unidentified, we stepped on it and flew out of there. On our way out, we passed huge numbers of deer on the road, and I swear I felt like they were aware of this thing and may have been 
running from it or possibly avoiding it. I just remember feeling worried for them, having to share the woods with that being. And at one point, just before topping the hill, a huge white owl swooped out of the trees and flew over our car. We all took that as a sign that we were safe and out of the thing's dominion. To this day, I have never seen another white owl. The whole way home, we were stunned and were trying our best to debunk this encounter and identify the creature as a regular animal. When we got back to the house, I pulled out this book we have on animals in our part of the world, and it listed the colors of their eye shine and headlights. The only animal that has a red eye shine is a night heron, and that thing sure as hell wasn't a bird. The next day, I even called the historical society of the nearest actual town and asked about the ghost town. The woman literally said this, um, it has a golf course. Why wouldn't she tell me anything about this place? It did indeed have a history worth mentioning, and she knew what I was talking about because she pointed out the golf course, which is just a few miles down the road. My later found out that, like most others, the abandoned town had attracted vandals and morons who had done all sorts of damage in the past. But most people looking to piss around and tear things up don't call historical societies beforehand. So that didn't quite explain her reluctance to tell me anything. After the encounter, we of course told our friends and families hoping that eventually someone would say, oh, that was probably A, and identify this thing for us. No one ever could. The only thing this did was convince some of our friends to go investigate for themselves, and they would come back telling wild stories of being watched and chased off by military people. What the hell? I don't know what happened to our friends, but part of me thinks that they were being stupid, lurking around the buildings, and had to be scared off like the idiot youngins they were, especially considering all the vandalisms which has occurred in the ghost town. But the odd thing is that I've read local forums about the ghost town and many people who do indeed believe that there is some weird military business going on there. Maybe they're using the area as some kind of covert training facility. I don't know. This is just one of those places which becomes weirder and weirder the more you investigate. This past year, I found a video online of some EVP sessions, a local paranormal group captured in a nearby house. There are multiple voices, and one is a young girl who is reciting a rhyme which you can hear clear as day. Micah, Micah, hi. Micah, hiney, hiney, ho. Then you hear something go, shh, and she continues the rhyme in a whisper. Micah, Micah, hi. Micah, hiney, hiney, ho. That rhyme is from the genie on the Pee Wee Herman. What the actual hell? And... On another site, I found a very unsettling account of a group of kids being led into the woods, thereby people they thought were the family members. Spoiler, it wasn't their family. I just know that this place is freaky, and that the three of us saw something there that doesn't exist in any natural history book. I was even trying to blame it on some undiscovered astralopithazine, and even that doesn't make any sense. To this day, I can see that creature in my mind, standing there, staring at us, with its flat face and glowing red eyes. We only went back to the valley once after that, again at about 2.30 in the morning. We didn't see the creature, but... There was a large fire burning in an open field about 20 yards from the road, but no one was anywhere to be found. No people, no car, nothing. 
we sure as hell weren't going to stop and investigate. The dead really are trying to tell me something. I had a haunting nine years ago. I was a single mother of a two-year-old boy and my nine-year-old niece. I had gotten custody of my niece due to her mother being an addict. We just moved into a nice apartment, and I was so excited to be able to give my kids a nice place to live. It was newly redone. New carpet, new walls, new trim, new everything. It was a weird setup, though. When you walk in, my bedroom was on the right, living room on the left, and dining room straight ahead. To the left of the dining room was the smaller bedroom, which also had its own full bathroom. I think it was more for roommates than a family. I started having paranormal encounters. The same day we moved in, so I always left both bedroom doors open at night so I could see into the kids' room, past the dining room table. From the start, I would wake up at around 3.12 a.m. every night. A lot of times, my son would too, but would start crying. I would wake up to an old woman in my room. She was always standing in the hall that led to the master bath. She would always try to talk to me. I could never hear her. Then, my son would cry, and I'd go comfort him, and then go back to bed. But sleep was hard to come by for me. As time went on, she would bang on the walls where the water heater was, jiggle door handles, knock photos off the wall, wake me up every single night at 3.12 a.m., she got more and more angry that I wasn't doing what she wanted, I guess, so eventually she started appearing as a black smoke-like mass. She would get closer and closer, mumbling something I couldn't make out. My cat would flee. I could feel her anger. I could feel the tension and frustration thick in the air. When she wasn't the black mass, she appeared more tattered and unkempt. Her hair would be a mess when it was once done up nicely. She would look so tired, sunken in eyes become more and more frightening. Her behavior was just downright aggressive. The banging became so loud that neighbors could hear it. She would rattle the doors violently. I thought maybe someone was trying to break in, but no one was even there. My dreams were cruel torments of me being murdered, having my children kidnapped every night. There weren't many nights that I didn't cry myself to sleep. I was doing my best to raise two kids, one of which wasn't mine, work a full-time job and then come home to so much negative energy. I decided to ask my neighbors about previous tenants as they lived there for many years. Apparently, a woman took care of an elderly mother. The mother died in my room. The apartment was totally redone because the woman literally had to wallow in her own feces. The daughter was very neglectful, and the pets were always never cleaned up after. I also found out the reason I was able to afford the apartment and that was because the rent was significantly lower than the other identical units. The manager of the apartments never told me any of this. Shortly after, I woke up again at 3.12 a.m., but instead of the old woman or blackness, I saw my son squatting down on the dining room table chair. I said, Troy, why are you up? He looked me straight in the eye, smiled his sweet smile, and whispered, Mama. I got up to go get him. As I reached for him, he just vanished. My heart sank. I couldn't breathe. I thought something happened to him. I ran into the kids' room, and there they both were. They were fine, sleeping away. 
I cried until I was totally exhausted and finally fell asleep. That's when I decided to break my lease and move. She would unpack boxes. She would hide things. She would turn the bathroom light off when I was in the shower. She was trying desperately to talk to me, and I had no idea how to listen. I mourned for her. I could feel her pain, but I also had a family to take care of. I had my stuff packed and moved in under a week. If you have any idea what it's like to be a single parent with two kids and a full-time job, then you know that was an amazing feat. I had a dream after we moved that there was a diary hidden behind the water tank. Why I never thought to look in there when that was where she kept banging. I just hope she found peace. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true, scary ghost stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes along with our gifted memberships. Donna, Nat Davies, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Chrissy Elias, Denise S., Tina Mead, Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, Haunted, and Anita B. Again, thank you all so much for remaining the pillar of which Back to Ashes stands. I cannot thank you enough. You have my sincerest gratitude, and of course you know I love you. Now for our gifted memberships, The Conspiracy Archives, Grimm's Library, Adam Gregg, and The Cryptid Sleeps. Thank you all so much for your continued support. I really do appreciate you. And for the rest of the subscribers or just random listeners that popped in, thank you as well for supporting the channel and listening to every video. Without you, I don't have a voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberlane is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.